Today we're going to look at a collection of problems from the Math GRE. And as you'll see, these problems come from a wide variety of courses that you might take as an undergrad. And I think this really highlights the fact that the Math GRE is pretty hard. Well, each of the problems themselves are not very hard, but the breadth of knowledge that you need, as well as all of the little tricks that you need to know, makes the whole thing pretty challenging. Okay, so anyway, let's jump into our first problem, which is a differential equation problem. So let's say we want to solve the differential equation, which is y prime plus x squared y over x cubed plus y equals zero. And we want to solve that with the initial condition of y of one equals one. Now, looking at this differential equation, I think, you know, and comparing it to all the different types of differential equations you learn to solve in a standard course, this looks closest to an exact differential equation. And in fact, if we rewrite this as x cubed plus y times y prime plus x squared times y equals zero, then it's really in the format of an exact differential equation. And that's where perhaps this would be called the function p, and then this would be called the function q. Perhaps the a sum would be in a different order if you were to look in a textbook, but this is pretty close. And now let's also recall that this is exact if the following equation is satisfied. And that is the partial of p with respect to y equals the partial of q with respect to x. So let's check that. Well, let's put an if here just to make sure that we know that that is the condition for this thing to be exact. So let's observe that the partial of p with respect to y is simply equal to x squared. But then the partial of q with respect to x, well observe that that is 3x squared. And these are not equal. So that means this thing is not an exact differential equation. And so generally if you've got something that looks close to being an exact differential equation but it's not an exact differential equation, you may multiply it by an integrating factor in order to maybe massage it until it is exact. And in that case, we can find a solution. Now, as you'll see in our special setup that we have here, there's actually a formula for what the integrating factor would be. But that being said, let's say that we don't know that. So let's multiply this by an integrating factor. Let's maybe set mu equal to mu of xy, just keeping in mind that this mu is a function of perhaps both x and y. And now that's gonna turn our differential equation into x cubed plus y times mu times y prime plus x squared y times mu equals zero. And now we've got new functions playing the role of p and q. So now the role of p is being played by this x squared y times mu, and q is being played by, well, x cubed plus y times mu. But we now hopefully can pick a special value of mu so that this is exact. So let's take the partial of p with respect to y. Let's observe that we get x squared mu plus x squared y times the partial of mu with respect to y, which we'll just write as mu sub y. And then the partial of q with respect to x, well, that's gonna be three x squared times mu, and then plus x cubed plus y times mu sub x, the partial of mu with respect to x. So that means in order for this to now be an exact differential equation, well, we're gonna need these two things to be equal. But in order for those two things to be equal, well, let's see what we'll have. We're gonna have something like this. 2x squared times mu equals, and so that's what we get from subtracting this x squared mu to the other side of the equation. And so it's gonna be equal to x squared times y times the partial of mu with respect to y and then minus x cubed plus y times the partial of mu with respect to x. And now looking at that, well, 
finding a function mu that is a function of x and y that satisfies this differential equation is probably pretty hard. But if we apply the strategy of wishful thinking, which is hoping that this could be equal to zero, the problem becomes quite a bit easier. But notice that this will be equal to zero if and only if mu sub x is equal to zero, which is the same thing as saying that mu is actually just a function of y. But that means that mu sub y could be rewritten as mu prime, if you will. Now, if we had gone back way to the beginning and done some sort of combination of these uh, partial derivatives with a quotient, there's a standard result that you might learn in a differential equations class that could allow you to skip some of these steps. But like I said, you could look that up if you want to. But now if that is equal to zero, what do we get? Well, let's observe that we can divide both sides by x squared and then uh, move some things around and we'll have something like this. So we'll have mu over mu prime is equal to two over y. But then integrating both sides, we have the natural log of mu equals two times the natural log of y, but that's gonna be the natural log of y squared using some simplifying logarithm rules. But now we can see that tells us that mu is equal to y squared. Okay, cool. So now we've got a value of our integrating factor and we can plug that back into our differential equation. So let's maybe write it in the other order this time. So we're gonna multiply by uh, mu, which is y squared. So that's gonna give us x squared y cubed and then plus Let's see, it'll be x cubed y squared and then plus y cubed times y prime equals zero. Now we don't really need to check that this is exact because by construction this is exact, which means we can just do the strategy for solving an exact differential equation, which means we wanna find this potential function, this psi such that the partial of psi with respect to x is x squared y cubed, and the partial of psi with respect to y is x cubed y squared plus y cubed. But now we can play this game where we maybe take the partial antiderivative of this with respect to x. So that means that psi is gonna be of the form, let's see, it'll be one third y or x cubed y cubed. And then of course we need to add a function of y because we're taking the antiderivative with respect to x, which means our constants are really functions of y. Okay, cool. And now we'll take the derivative of this with respect to y. So that's gonna give us x cubed y squared plus g prime of y. And then we simply equate these two things. But equating those two things tells us that g prime of y must be equal to y cubed. But if g prime of y is y cubed, that means g of y is equal to a quarter y to the fourth. But let's see, that means that we can plug that into our function that we have for psi, and that'll leave us with one third x cubed y cubed plus a quarter y to the fourth equals a constant. But then we can apply our uh, initial condition that we need y of uh, or one to be equal to one. So in other words, we'll plug in x equals one, y equals one, and that'll give us a value of c. But then when all is said and done, after we perhaps clear denominators, we'll have this nice, curve, which is 4x cubed y cubed plus 3y to the fourth equals 7. And that would be the final solution to our differential equation. Okay, so now let's move on to the next type of problem. So our next problem is a linear algebra type problem. So let's say we're given this 2 by 2 matrix A, which is 4, negative 2, 5, negative 3 red row, row wise. Now we wanna show that a to the fourth is the same thing as five a plus six times the identity matrix. But that's equivalent to saying that a to the fourth minus five a minus six times the identity matrix is equal to zero. 
Okay, so now we could calculate some things out, like take the fourth power of a and then combine it together in this fashion and see that we get zero. But there's a trick here. And the trick is to first look at the characteristic polynomial. So the characteristic polynomial of a, where we are using x as the variable, well, so that's going to be the determinant of, well, it's going to be a minus x times i. In other words, that's the determinant of 4 minus x, and then, uh, let's see, minus 2, 5, and then minus x minus 3. But then using the standard formula for the determinant, that's going to give us x minus 4 times x plus 3, and then let's see, plus 10. And here I just took the minus signs from both of those things on the diagonal and combined them together to make this look a little nicer. But then multiplying this out, you can see pretty quickly that this is the same thing as x squared minus x and then minus 2. But what do we know about the characteristic polynomial? Well, we know a number of things, but maybe the important thing in this setting is that if we evaluate the characteristic polynomial at the matrix, we get zero. So in this case, that means that we have a squared minus two times a minus two times the identity matrix is zero. Sorry, that should be just minus a there. Okay, so now what are we gonna do from there? Well, let's take the polynomial, which is hinted at here, which is x to the fourth minus five x minus six, and observe that we can factor it using this polynomial, the characteristic polynomial. In fact, this is x squared minus x minus 2 times, and now you can check this for yourself, x squared plus x plus 3. Okay, cool. But now, observe that that's simply equal to something, I'll just put a box here, times the characteristic polynomial of a. But now that means that we have a to the fourth minus five times a minus six times the identity is equal to something times the characteristic polynomial of a evaluated at a, which we said was zero. But of course, this being equal to zero is exactly the same thing as what we wanted to show. Okay, so now let's move on to another problem. So our next problem is a little ring theory problem. And so let's say we've got a ring R so that for all elements A and R, we have A squared equals A. So sometimes this is known as a Boolean ring. And in fact, if you know stuff about Boolean rings, then it's pretty easy to show these things right here. In fact, these are some of the defining properties of Boolean rings. Well, I guess this first one is the defining property. So these are some standard quick results. Okay, so we wanna show three things, that A is equal to negative A, but let's observe that that is equivalent to saying that two times a is equal to zero. In other words, a plus a is equal to zero. Now, assuming the ring has more than one element, that pretty quickly gets you to saying that here the characteristic is two, but that's kind of neither here nor there. Okay, so now let's see how we might do this. So let's observe we have 2a is the same thing as 4a minus 2a, but then 4a is the same thing as 4a squared because a squared is the same thing as a, but then 4a squared is the same thing as 2a all squared. But then since we're in this setup where a squared is equal to a, 2a squared is just 2a. So this turns into 2a minus 2a, which is zero. So we've shown that 2a is equal to zero, but like we said before, that's the same thing as saying that a is its own additive inverse. In other words, a is equal to negative a. Okay, so the next thing we wanna show is that ab plus ba is equal to zero. So how can we do that? Well, let's start with a plus b and observe that a plus b is the same thing as a plus b quantity squared because we have this setup right here. But then multiplying that out, we get a squared plus ab plus ba plus b squared. We don't yet know that this is commutative, so that means that we can't say that this is 2 times a times b, because like I said, we don't have commutativity yet. But let's see. 
We know that a squared is the same thing as a, so we can cancel those from both sides of the equation. b squared is equal to b, so we can cancel those from both sides of the equation. But then all we're left on the left-hand side with is nothing, in other words, zero. So that gives us ab plus ba is equal to zero. Now let's show that this thing is commutative to finish it all off. So let's observe that AB plus AB is the same thing as 2AB, which is 0, by number 1. But then 0 is equal to AB plus BA by number 2. But now what we can do is cancel an AB from both sides of the equation, and we'll see that we have AB is equal to BA, which is the condition for this thing to be a commutative ring. Okay, so we've got one more problem. And the last problem is to find all group homomorphisms from Z20 to Z12. Okay, so let's observe a couple of things just to get us started. So the first thing is that Z20 is a cyclic group. And in fact, it's a cyclic group that is additively built by the number one. And so that means we just need to find where phi sends one, and then we'll know what it does to everything in Z20. And then another thing is this little result right here, and I'll just put the special case that we'll use, and that is the order of the element of phi of one inside of Z12 has to divide the order of one inside of Z20. So this holds in a more general sense for group homomorphisms, given that you have finite orders here. Okay, so that tells us that the order of phi of 1 has to divide 20. And that's because the order of 1 in Z20 is obviously equal to 20. And then also, let's observe that phi of 1 is an element of Z12. But since it's an element of Z12, its order, so the order of phi of 1 has to divide 12. And that's by a consequence of Lagrange's theorem. So let's see, the order of phi of 1 has to simultaneously divide 20 and 12. So that means it needs to be a common divisor of 20 and 12. But that means that the order of phi of 1 is from the set 1, 2, and 4. Those are the only common divisors of 12 and 20. And now we'll just look at each of those cases one at a time. So I'll just put like little circles around the orders that we're working with. So let's see, if the order of phi of 1 is equal to 1, that means that phi of 1 is 0. That's because inside of Z12, there's only one thing with order 1, and that is the identity element 0. But that means that phi of n is equal to 0 for all n in Z20. Now let's look at the second case. So the second case is the order of phi of 1 is equal to 2. But there's a single element of order 2 in Z12, and that element is 6. So that means that phi of 1 is equal to 6. Of course, that's because 6 plus 6 is 12, which is 0. But in general, that means that phi of n is equal to 6n. Now, what about the third case, when phi of 1 has an order of 4? But there are two things inside of Z12 with an order of 4. There's 3, because if you add 3 to itself, you get 0. And there is 9. And that's because if you add 9 to itself, you get 0. Now, there's a general formula for the order inside of Zn, which maybe we'll write at the end. But each of these leads us to phi of n is equal to 3n or phi of n is equal to 6n. So there we have it. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4 homomorphisms. And now for that general result, let's say we are inside of Zn. The order of the element m is equal to n over the GCD of m and n. Now, of course, before we had small numbers, so we didn't really need to think too hard about this result, but if you've got larger numbers, perhaps this result is helpful. And that's a good place to stop.